Pitch. We are so honored to be joined today by Dr. Tanya Mitchell Spradlin, Director of Wind Band Studies at Penn State University. Yay! Hi, Dr. Mitchell Spradlin. How are you? Hello. I am excellent. I am so happy to be here. Thank you for asking me to join you this afternoon. Oh, absolutely. You have been somebody who I think for all of us, we have seen the work that you have been doing within the communities um, that we are a part of. And we it was just an obvious choice to have you on the podcast. So we're very grateful to have you on today. Um, well, for some people who may not have encountered the work you have done yet, why don't you give us a little bit of a background of like where you've come from, your education and all that stuff? Sure. I grew up in Georgia from the South. Uh, I lived in Lawrenceville, Georgia, and I went to elementary school, middle school, high school in Lawrenceville, Georgia, went to Berkmore High School. And I started playing the clarinet when I was in middle school band and loved uh, being in band, loved my music experiences and wanted to continue uh, engaging, having a life that was engaged in music. And I wanted to be a band director. Actually, I wanted to be a band director since I was in sixth grade. Uh, So my clarinet teacher pushed me to uh, take lots of auditions, and I ended up going to Indiana University in Bloomington uh, to study clarinet and to get a degree in music education. And then I student taught on the Navajo Reservation in Kayenta, Arizona, before going back to Georgia, actually, as my first job teaching high school in Georgia, uh, Shambly High School in Shambly, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta, and I loved it. I taught there for four years and um, absolutely loved that experience. Still talk to some of those students and parents. Just had a conversation yesterday with a former student, um, just keeping up with them and what they're doing in their life. Uh, While I was teaching at Shambly, I did my master's degree in music education from the University of Georgia. There was a program, and I'm not sure if the program is offered anymore. It's called the SEAT program. You can get a master's degree. Uh, It's a lot of time in the summer. So you've got to live in Athens in the summer and then a couple times driving back and forth. So uh, I was able to complete my degree and kept teaching. And then I left and went to, to the University of Kansas, where I did my doctorate in wind conducting. I chose to go to KU because the director of bands, Paul Popeil, was my first ever conducting teacher at Indiana University, and I wanted to study with him. Then I hopped around, then I went back to Georgia again, and I taught for one year at Valdosta State University in South Georgia, like the last town you hit before you go to Florida. Um, Yes. (laughs) And then went to the University of South Carolina. And I taught there for three years as the assistant director of bands and the associate director of athletic bands. And now, now I'm at Penn State and I'm so happy to be at Penn State. I'm in my second year. Uh, it feels like another first year because last year was so difficult with the pandemic, but I'm so happy to be here in State College, Pennsylvania. Oh my gosh, I meant to say go dogs, go cocks. Oh, I know. Yes. <laughs> I like everything. Oh my god. I just kept talking. <laughs> that, that's amazing. You have so much experience in different parts of, of the country. And I, I got super intrigued when you started talking about talking um like teaching on the Navajo reservation. Um that's really I'll I'll go back to that later. But yeah, that you seem to have a very diverse background of ed, not only education, but where you have had the opportunity to teach at. Um which is not a lot of people, I think, get that experience of being able to teach in different and actually learn in different parts of, of the country. But I think that's a real music is that we do get to experience that a lot, which is amazing. Um, yeah, so that's that's awesome. What have you have you seen a difference? Is it a huge difference in teaching in different parts of the country as you have seen it? Or is it pretty adjustable everywhere you go or? That's a really good question, Lauren. There are some differences. Um, Obviously, teaching on the reservation was very, very different, Uh, just a completely different um, culture and um, just being engaged in society was different there. Um, But for everywhere else, it's each school of music and and each part of the country has a little bit of a different different vibe, different uh, value system slightly. But for the most part, it's pretty similar excellent students who are just really want to learn. And I was really happy to everywhere I went, the students were totally engaged and wanted to learn and the faculty wanted to teach and very much cared about students and cared about their growth as musicians and humans. And that was always what made me 
uh, what made it really great to travel around because I just locked into that value system shared by my colleagues at these different schools. Um, also, like one thing that you just said um, about you were still in contact with your students um, back in your high school teaching days. And um, that, first of all, is just so amazing as a student to still be able to talk to you after years, you know, has passed. How does that feel for you now being a director of a university, but still keeping tabs on your high school babies? Like, you know, make sure they're staying on track to accomplish the great things that you know they can accomplish. How is that? Uh, I, I think that's the most exciting thing about being a educator. I think that's probably, I would say the single most validating thing in, in my career is, mm -hmm. is that relationship with those students. And I still keep in touch with some from Valdosta state and some from the university of South Carolina too. Um, but just having them in those, those formative years. And for when I taught high school, I saw a whole graduating class go through. And my first year teaching for a lot of them was their ninth grade year. My fourth year teaching was their senior year. And then they went off to college. And so we had a lot of you know, firsts experiences together that I shared with them throughout the process. And it, it, it kind of created this, this bond with the, this cohort of students that all went through at that time. Yeah. It's just, um, I know that we talk a little bit on here about um, just being represented and, and visibility and how it is just important for students to see um, that there are uh, places in music where we belong, um, especially like for me um, growing up, not really seeing a lot of black representation in the classical arts or in the wind band in general. Um, and so those students getting to see you doing your thing, rocking out, having fun, just doing music, I'm pretty sure all of those students just, you were like their big like mentor, you're, you're the big just star, like if she can do it, I can do it too. And honestly, I was not your student, but just seeing you do things, I was like, oh my gosh, like there are places for us. And so I just want to take the time and just thank you for just being who you are and doing great things and changing what we would th what we would think that wind ensemble or classical music kind of looks like. So thank you for doing that work for us. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Mm, absolutely. I was like blown away by like when you were saying like everything you went to, like you found your way to Indiana. That's a far away. By the way, if anybody has driven through Indiana, it looks just like Georgia. There's nothing to it like like the south part of Georgia and, and Indiana looks just the same. But um, and then you found your way back home, so to speak. But your student teaching, you did that on a reservation. Which one again did you say? I did it on the Navajo reservation. Okay. How did you get there? How did that whole process like? Because that just like intrigued me when you said, I was like, wait, that's, is that in Indiana? No, it's not. I'm like, I was like questioning <laughs> my whole map skills I was about to bust out an atlas over here. Um, <laughs> how did you get go about that journey of your life? Oh, that's a good question, Michael. And you know, it's funny about what you said, because so many of my travels, I also had to take out the map, like, where am I going? And where is this place? <laughs> <laughs> so Indiana University at the time that I was an undergrad had a program that when you or several programs, so that by the time it's uh, you're ready to student teach, you have three options, you can stay in the state of Indiana and teach at the public schools in that area. Um, you can uh, teach on that, the, specifically the Navajo reservation, that, which is the largest reservation. So a lot of schools and a lot of opportunities, mm -hmm. or you could do the overseas project. You know, my roommate student taught in Ireland, uh, a friend of mine student taught in Kenya. And I really wanted to get out of Indiana uh, because I had taught in a lot of the schools in the area, just in practicums and teching and clinicking with high school bands. I just wanted to try something different. I wanted to see what else was out there. And I thought, well, if this is a program that's offered, well, let's go do it. <laughs> it's still under the, you know, the, it's still under the umbrella of school mm -hmm. and school in and of itself is a little safer than 
then leaving to go teach in a different area after you've graduated. Right. So I thought, okay, well, I'm, I'm still in school. This is still counts as credit and they place you with somebody. So you're not alone. And so I had a placement partner from a different IU campus and we drove out there together and stayed out there for six months. I actually tried to get a job there. Um, I wanted to stay and I was not successful in finding uh, a high school band job on the reservation. So I ended up coming back. That's awesome. Is this, so many questions. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like same. Uh, so, because like, I don't think, I mean, in uh, our modern day music education, I don't think we, we discussed um, like going to either teaching on a reservation or honestly teaching across seas. So can you explain, you know, is it like public, American school or, or is it different? Does it, and how does band fit into that? Sure. Some of the schools on the reservation are like, uh, like public schools, like you would see in all the places that we're from middle school, uh, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and then high school and high school has basketball team. And, um, you know, all the same classes you go from period to period when the bell rings, it's just just as you would expect. Uh, the difference is that the really big schools obviously have really big resources and more resources. The smaller schools don't have as many resources. So the particular school where I student taught was a middle school and it fed into a high school program and the high school band was thriving. The middle school, well, thriving, I think for that area, which is that there was a band in existence and there were instruments and music and students engaged. Mm -hmm. The middle school band, uh, the music program was really large in choir, really large in piano and guitar. And the band had been in existence for a while and then stopped. And then we were kind of starting it back up when I was there. And I remember not, we didn't have enough instruments for everybody. We didn't have enough chairs for everybody. So oh, some wow. people had to sit on um, like crates and buckets so that they could play and, and we'd get the music, um, still use essential elements, good old essential elements. <laughs> uh, but we'd have to get creative with some of those resources. Lots of grant writing, lots of, um, you know, writing uh, requests for, uh, just for the basic things to to function to have a program function but instruments to start with chairs stands yeah that's so interesting to me um i don't know just thinking about the different i'm here in, in albuquerque new mexico and anyone who knows anything about albuquerque you know we have a huge population of um native americans specifically i think we have the navajo we also have pueblo we have a lot of different communities in this area um and that's not something i don't think even our education majors and this is something i, I want to look into more like have the opportunity to to go do that and that would be and i'm thinking for anthony out of the us three of uh, michael you're the one who had uh, you went through um uh student teaching and so like how different would that have been if you were actually given the opportunity to go like not just in georgia but like you had the opportunity to go on res res reservations or even to go teach abroad that's an insane concept to think mm -hmm. about yeah, I mean, I know that um, at specifically our university, um, you only had two options, which was teach in Georgia, which was local, or you could do the study abroad program. But the option of, you know, going to another state or anything like that was definitely not the option. Um, and you didn't even have an option to kind of um, go anywhere outside of Georgia, minus the little hundred mile radius of your school. Um, so I think that, first of all, Indiana, great. Those three options, fantastic. I think music education, I think all education school needs to have that because there are way more, uh, I would say, uh, people and cultures that we need to really kind of understand. Because as a new teacher, when you start to realize like, oh my gosh, I'm in control of all these people and I have no idea the culture of what's going on. I'm so confused right now. What am I supposed to do? And it's like learning on the spot. Um, and I think as a, a school that you know teaches teachers, we should be trying to change that. Like, let's make our, our new teachers comfortable ready for stuff like this. So hopefully that'll happen 
we'll see. Maybe in the next 50 years or so, we'll, <laughs> let's pray. Let's pray. <laughs> I had a question um, in regards to uh, repertoire, kind of moving towards repertoire. Something I think I read from your bio, maybe it was from your uh, the bio that was on Penn State's uh, website. Um, a part was, uh, as a proponent of new music, uh, she's engaged in building the wind band medium. So um, I see, it, it may seem, or I think that says that you have a really huge interest in new wind band music. And so what um and i saw some of the works that you have um i think been in the consortium for and even commissioned new works so like talk about uh your your interest within or your passion for new music sure um i i care very much that when someone is in wind ensemble now or comes to a concert it looks like 2021 and it looks like we're caring very much about the tradition that has built our medium, but also thinking forward to where we're going, um, as opposed to, I don't want anyone to come to our, a concert and it be something that we could have also done 20 years ago or 30 years ago, right? And so uh, I, I also care very much about who is writing music that is representative of the students in front of me. You know, and as I never saw anyone who looked like me uh, as a composer until not that long ago. And yeah. I went all the right. Yeah. I went all the way through school. And I don't think I ever, or maybe I just didn't pay attention because I know for a fact um, in ensembles, I remember playing music by Joni Green. So we definitely played music by women. I remember um, and again, maybe I just wasn't paying as much attention, but it didn't really click mm -hmm. that uh, that representation was you know, readily and actively included on the upper right-hand part of the page and then engage with the students. And so that's important to me. Um, so new music sometimes, or, or music by living composers, sometimes is also synonymous with representation and inclusivity in music because there's so many composers and young composers. And especially now it's kind of like this boom of, of composers and this, strong, let's say that the impetus for being inclusive has really increased in the past several years. Um, and that has directly led to a lot of uh, championing of composers writing for our medium. Uh, so that's important to me. It's also important to me that my students understand the process of the continuation of our medium, which is commissioning or joining a consortium or talking to a composer about their process or engaging with a composer in rehearsals and then seeing that product through uh, to the performance. Um, so kind of on an educational aspect of working with getting, of engaging students in the process, but also um, just trying to help continue to push band so that, well, it's relevant. <laughs> so it stays relevant and engaging and doesn't stagnate. Mm -hmm. Something you said was super, I don't know if we've actually talked about this concept or maybe we have at some point, but um, you, were, you were talking about how maybe you did at some point have or remember playing works by minority underrepresented women composers, but it didn't register or it didn't click at the time that that was that. And I think it's just as important to put that music as just as important as it is to put that music in front of young players. It's just as important to talk to them about like the importance and the significance behind this person or these this groups of, of group of people or groups of people um, like why it's significant that they are now composing music or their works are now being put out into um, the I guess the the main canon. Um, because, and this is something that we talked about in, in, when we talk about uh, choirs and spirituals and why it's just not, you can't just give a choir a spiritual and say, sing it, right? Mm -hmm. It's so much that goes into that process. And so it's just, I think, I think about it the same way as putting a piece of music by like a woman or a minority in front of a band saying, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about how this is different than the things, that we, other things that we've been playing Um yeah, I, and that's that's a concept that isn't talked about as much. It's like the representation of being able to play that music, but do you understand the significance behind it? And I know Anthony, Anthony definitely talks about that a lot, being a teacher and being an educator um, and someone who tries to put like music by underrepresented people in front of his students. So that that was a really cool concept to think about. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go for it. Um, 
for me, I had the same exact feeling and uh, kind of re uh, revelation as you did, because um, I remember I got to college and I was like, okay, all of these, like, you know, now people who I've never, you know, heard of are now composing or like never seen these type of people either, whether they're black or female composers. But then I kind of went back in my head. I was like, well, in middle school, we did play pieces by William Owens, which is a black composer, but like until I put two and two together, it, it did not really gel. So yeah, we did put it, it other than, oh yeah, we're playing this piece by this, you know, I guess, and I'm not shading any of my teachers. I love them very dearly, but we didn't do any, you know, okay, who is this composer? Why did they write this song? So I would, I never knew until years after middle school before I really um, got that understanding. And now that I, I love when ensemble music, that's like my passion as well. Um, and something that you said about relevance I and mean, staying relevant. Um, that's an, we've had this argument on, or not even an argument, it's just been a, a debate on this podcast about, you know, newer music versus, uh, I guess, whatever you can call the standards or, yes. <laughs> again, like you said, pieces that could have been performed 20, 30, and honestly, 60 years ago. Uh, but I, me personally, I don't want my program to be something that said ensemble performed at Midwest in 1972. I don't want that. That's just not who I am. I want music of today. I want these uh, these new composers are writing things that are familiar to students of today, and that's what they relate to. Um, and so that's what I want to put in front of my kids. And it was so important that you said we got to keep it relevant and relevant to the people who are who are in front of us, who are looking at us to educate them. So I love that you said that. Yeah, and um, I actually have this. So I feel like. Um, I like to think about it as if my program were a society, would I want to live in it? So on the, the basics of music, you know, is it all the same key? Is it all the same meter? Is it all the same energy or mood? That's not very exciting. Uh, it needs to have a wide variety of those things. Is it all the same gender? You know, most societies, well, no society is capable of existing or perpetuating itself um, with a single gender. Um, so is it representative there? Is it representative of different backgrounds and styles? And, um, uh, and that's where I look for composers and pieces written for or about or by um, composers who have different nationalities, um, just completely different backgrounds. But I do think, you know, that that inclusion of pieces that are older, you know, and same thing in a society is going to have, you know, the older people who are passing down their wisdom and tidbits and, and things that they've learned to live by. And then the younger people who are actively with ears open, trying to listen and evolve. And so I think it, a little of, of all of that is important. So I, I try very hard to make sure that there's music on the program that, you know, it, we celebrate its it's uh, its role in the growth of the band and maybe the growth of the band in the 40s, 50s, when there wasn't that much original music for band. And there's music that has taken that growth and kind of pushed it to a new new heights now. So it's try to have a, a wide variety of time periods and people and styles and something for everybody. That's the hope, something for everybody who comes to the concert. <laughs> And, uh, which makes gonna, it hard to program <laughs> oh yes i was gonna <laughs> piggyback off of what you were just saying when i was going through school i loved love loved all my music written before 1950 yes he did and yes, Lauren, you did too a little bit don't be playing oh, over there i do i do too <laughs> okay I, well i was i was like over here like y'all give me medieval renaissance baroque that's all i need in my life and we will be i'll, I'll be the happiest right, way ever. back i was oh, like way back and way then back. i anthony uh we were roommates he exposed me to winds of nagual mm. by michael colgrass and because wind band is my favorite medium 
Second favorite. Brass Quintet's my first, then Wim Van. I, I'm not a huge fan of orchestra, but that's not neither here or there for right this conversation right now. But he exposed me to that piece, and I hated it. Like, I was like, this is stupid. This is not music. This is just weird noises that are thrown together. Fast forward four, or two years, we're playing Winds in a Wall. It's my favorite piece ever. And, like, pieces like Winds in a Wall, um, what is a uh, Circus Maximus is now my favorite piece for Wind Band. Mountains Rising Nowhere. Joan Tower wrote a piece for uh, Brass Quintet called Copper Wave. There's not, like, no melody in there. And I think it's the best piece ever that I've, like, played to this date. And I'm over here, like, going the whole route. I'm like, new music, everything. I want the audience to be thinking all the time. So how do you get somebody who doesn't like new music? How do you help the people in your ensemble to come around to the idea? And how maybe if people are so in love with new music, they're like, who needs a melody? It's 2021. Melodies are a social construct force upon us, if they would say something like that. <laughs> how could you get them around to something that's uh, a little bit more like that? Well, see, I'm one of those people, Michael, who I, I'd like to have a melody too. And so <laughs> I, I love a melody. I also, so I, what I like is a balance. Mm -hmm. I like a balance. And I, and your question was, how do you get people who might not like new music to come around? But like, and the mountains rising nowhere is written in 1977. That wasn't really, that wasn't That's not the really other nice. day. That was a yeah. while ago. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of Joan tower pieces and eighties, nineties. So that was even then was 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So like this whole idea of new music kind of has a different, um, you kind of, it had a, has a different lens depending mm -hmm. on when it was written. And so again, to answer your question, how do I get somebody who like really just wants to hear the Chacon theme from the Holst first suite, or just really wants to hear these beautifully resolved cadences and Granger's music um, and not, uh, for instance, we're working right now on Sally Lamb McHugh's High Water Rising. And there's some, there's definitely a melody in there, but there's also a lot of moments where it's really thick and dense and heavy and might be a little uncomfortable for the listener at times. Mm -hmm. And I think a little bit of everything or some mixture in the program to create like this, this flow, you know, for the concert goer and also for the students here. Yes, there's a melody. You can latch on to it. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. And now I'm going to push you into something different. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we have to do that as educators. You know, we have to one meet students where they are, right. That's you know something we always learn music education, meet them where they are and push them. And the same thing is for audiences as well, meet them where they are and, and, and push them and say that, yeah, we're not saying that the music of the past or, or Holst or Granger or any of that is bad. Um, now we can talk about Granger, we can talk about Granger's background and then, then we, that gets, you know, that gets different. Mm -hmm. But we're not saying that music of the past is bad. We're saying, let's celebrate what has built our medium and, and the elements of music that that creates for our students and for our audiences. And now let's see what else there is and expose them to that too, so that we're not just educating our students. We're also educating you know, the, the people who ingest, who come to our concerts. They don't see all the work that goes in for months and months and months. They see the one, the one, usually only one of all. And what are they saying to them? And so that this balance and this inclusion of kind of pushing forward and including, that's why world premieres and commissions and consortiums are, are so important, pushing us in where we're going sonically, orally. And, and you know, I'm sorry, I'm a little soapbox here, but no. so much of what's going to move our medium forward is not even just the pieces themselves, but how we're performing. Mm -hmm. Performing, you know, we expect people to just show up on a random Tuesday at seven o'clock and sit real quiet and still while they listen to our hour program and then just go home. Like, so what are we doing? Are we going to communities? Are we going to schools? Are we inviting people into our, into our medium? Are we being inclusive? Are we including other genres? No, are we, are we working with choirs? Are we working with dance? Are we doing hip hop and wind ensemble? I know UGA is doing something like that. I just thought it was really, really cool. Yeah. So there's so many ways that we've got to, and that, that the medium is currently, but has a lot of room to expand. 
and a lot of room. Um, to go off of that, like I love like solo and chamber stuff. That's where I love to live within the music. And Anthony likes a nice little old wind band. Like I love like that's his medium. And so to get him to come to my medium sometimes, I'm like thinking of like what can I do instead of standing on a stage with a piano and be like, I'm gonna present this hour long thing of just two instruments. One has 88 keys and I have three buttons. Mm -hmm. Let's go and see what happens. Like, can I make this like a holistic, like a visual and auditory experience for the people in the audience? Like maybe can I have like some lights changing, have a, not a light show, but like have a light show, a dancer come in. Like what can I do in my medium to expand for the audience to latch on to not only like maybe a melody they hear or maybe a mood I'm creating. Can they visually see that either through like um, lights or a dancer if I want to like collab with somebody or if, what is my body movement doing? Like when I look at an orchestra or a wind band, I don't necessarily want to see them like I'm like, okay, but can you, can you move? Can you tell me that you're liking the music that you're playing right now? Can you tell me that you're knowing where we're going? Like, do you love it? Do you like love creating music with the people that you're on stage with? That's my big one thing about large ensembles and looking at them like, like, I feel like sometimes large ensembles and every ensemble is like, you're over there, there's a glass and we're sitting here and we're observing you present something to us. Instead of like us being in a whole room, mixing all of our feelings, I'm you're taking me on a journey, but you're also on a journey. And how can we combine our journeys to end? And when we resolve this thing for the last time, mm, well said. Yeah, I have so many thoughts about the idea, the how how something is uh, presented, like going that route, not just like what you're presenting, but how you're presenting, and this idea of. Um, going away from a very everyone's just so stiff collared and no one can move like if, if someone coughs like have you ever been like or I'm sure have you ever experienced that point in a symphony orchestra concert where someone something or coughs or is doing something everyone has just goes <laughs> like it's like like snakes <laughs> sure. are trying to find like what what's disturbing everyone from what's going on and like while I do understand the the respect that is being had for not only the mu the music that is being performed but the musicians who are on stage and of course no you don't want to distract um anyone on stage but during like like if you go into like a cool jazz club and everything and like everyone's hooting and hollering and every the, people are just saying things in the audience and just going mm, yes play that and like that's not distracting the the performers they're actually they're using that to continue into the, it's like a an actual collaboration um between the audience and the the people who are presenting the music and so it's i don't know it's i'm i'm thinking I, my head is like kind of spinning thinking about how in the world would would that look like a an orchestra concert where people are it's like church you know how in church it, like my mom in church i remember I have very specific memories of her going mm, speak and just it, all the little things she would blurt out during church and it was a part of it it was not the the church wasn't just the pastor preaching the sermon on the Sunday it was also everyone who was giving back, right, you know, right. in the audience and giving uh, the ad libs and all those things that happened. Um, so yeah, that's that's a really interesting concept that I haven't really thought too much about. But now I want to think about more. <laughs> I want to do more uh, research into this. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, you know we're so trained into these uh, traditions of of respect, you know, for the and, and decorum for those who are on the stage. It'll be really hard to to encourage <clears throat> to encourage the audience to get out of those things, particularly in the structure of the concert hall. And so I, I feel like we can't just have the same venue and the same format and then say, no, 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 but it's okay. You can clap immediately after the solo and it's okay to say things because we're so trained into this, this institution, this uh, environment. I remember we, last year at the end of, um, at the end of the year, the wind ensemble, one of the pieces was Miss Linka's short symphony, Give Us This Day. And there was, we were in our dress rehearsal. We didn't, we weren't allowed to have audiences uh, even for the performance, but in the dress rehearsal, some of the stage crew started clapping and cheering at the wrong spot. 
of the first movement. There's like this big, heavy drive, and then there's a release, and then there's still some music left. <laughs> it's not yeah. over. <laughs> and they started cheering, and they're like, yes, 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 yes. And the students, they weren't thrown off. They didn't miss an entrance, but they were so much more excited. They were invigorated, and you could see them go, <sighs> and they played really well. And just yeah. to have that validation as you go is something that they get from each other as they play. They get it from the conductor, but they don't get it, you know, from the audience in, in real time. So it was exciting kind of to see them react that way. Mm -hmm. Piggyback off of that, like we go to people love to talk about the pageantry arts. I love the pageantry arts. You go to a competition, DCI or high school, when there's a solo, you clap. And when there's a huge brass moment where they just blow your face off, you're like, whoa! yes or like jazz when someone like rips and blows over these chords you're like oh my god he got something to say you're like saying stuff and i think michael tilson thomas i think at some of his concerts were like if you like this solo please clap please hoot and holler like i am encouraging that and like i would just like I'd just imagine what it would be like to like hear prelude of an afternoon or fawn just, or thinking about that however, that just, just like so like the amazing <laughs> christina smith at asl plays it and you're like she played that flute and then just imagine like how everybody would just look at you like what did you just say and i'm just like i'm just imagining it uh how dare you feel something in real time <laughs> you're only allowed to feel at the end <laughs> i love i love that in real time how dare you <laughs> how dare you um, i have a question because i think this is a very hard thing for um, I would say the newer generations of, of teachers, um, when trying to program, um, we have the workhorses specifically in the wind ensemble world, such as Granger. But when we start to do background research of that composer, and then things are uncovered about said composer, and I, this can go for any of composers, and you find out things that isn't so good. <laughs> Do we still perform their music? Do we not? Do we perform their music, but we explain that this is how the society was at this time. This person was acting in the way of the time, but this music, however, is separate. So is the artist and the, and, and the art separate or are they together? What are your thoughts? I, I have, uh, that's a heavy question and mm -hmm. I think it depends. I don't have a set in stone. This is how I react to all pieces and all composers that mm -hmm. I find problematic. Mm -hmm. There are some that I'll think, well, I probably just won't play any of that person's <clears throat> music anymore. And I don't feel like it will be doing me a disservice or my students a disservice to cut that out of um, the repertoire selections I'll make for the rest of my life. Um, I don't see a problem with that. And then there are other composers where I think, what will I be taking away from students by not programming this music? So let's say Granger specifically, specifically Percy Granger. We know Percy Granger probably wouldn't like the fact that I was programming his music. His music. Yep. Uh, yes. Yep. Right. <laughs> and so <laughs> should the students know that as they perform it? I think so. And so mm -hmm. if I were playing the music of Granger, yeah, that's definitely a conversation to be had. Mm -hmm. We've had these conversations at Penn State. Why is this ensemble playing the music of Granger? What is Granger's background? And it's not specific to, to Granger necessarily because every piece that's performed for any of the ensembles, that composer has their background shared, their life shared, you know, nobody's, we're not just programming pieces in a vacuum and saying, play this. We're programming pieces and saying, here's why we're programming this piece. Here's some information about the composer. Uh, let's, let's zoom with the composer all to help us have a better and more authentic performance of the piece. So back to Granger. Granger is a composer who I personally will continue to play some of his music. And here are the things that I ask myself in making the decision to do so. I think, what does Granger's music have to offer that I can't find duplicated elsewhere? How does Granger write for woodwinds, saxophones in particular, that I find moving? How does he orchestrate uh, the wind ensemble in a way that can I find it somewhere else? 
And I think if I cannot find this somewhere else, and if that's a value of mine for the ensemble, then I'm going to play the music and then talk about the background and talk about that decision why. And students or others may disagree or agree, but I always find that we are in a better place when we come from knowledge and reasoning. So this is the reason, let's have a discourse about it. There are other composers like Henry Fillmore, uh, for instance, Last is Trombone, I'll never play that piece. Mm -hmm. um, there's no reason to, I, for me personally, it's, it's too scarring of a background. And I don't find that that piece necessarily has anything unique that I can't find duplicated in other music. I don't feel like students are missing out. I don't feel like I'm missing out. And mm -hmm. so I don't have a problem kind of erasing it. Um, from my, you know, lexicon of, of pieces. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of other pieces like that where I don't, I've have made rectified with myself that it's not a problem for me to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So it's a diff, I'm glad that you asked that question. It's a really difficult question, but, you know, for, for maybe teachers out there or public school teachers or young teachers in making that very difficult decision on, are you going to choose to play something? Are you going to cut it out completely? Are you going to play it with a disclaimer? Are you gonna have this discussion with your students? How do you have this discussion with your students? There are questions you have to ask. And that is one, can you personally, what are your personal thoughts about it? Because if you personally can't stand this composer in this piece, then you're not gonna have a good time putting it together. Right. You have to love everything that you program for your students. You have to love it. And if you don't, then there's no point in putting something on a program because you think you have to. And I like to also ask myself the question, what compositionally does this piece have to offer? And can I find that elsewhere? Yes or no. And if the answer is no, then that leads to the next set of questioning. Should I do this piece? And what, what's that conversation going to look like? Yeah. Um, and I think for my last question, um, for the ones that want to um, find uh, other pieces that might have the same, you know, compositional value to it. Um, and also added on uh, when we we're talking about new pieces, where do you find new pieces? Where, where do you find um, either these new pieces that are coming out or uh, when it comes to this conversation, where can you find pieces that of the same compositional value, but just not by this composer? What are some of those places for teachers to go start to look? So some great places to look. There's a book called The Horizon Leans Forward. Oh, right here. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Boom. That, that's a great book. We're reading that um, chapter by chapter in my graduate seminar. And uh, that has an annotated list of a, a lot of pieces by um, diverse composers to program with an ensemble. I also really like to, uh, windrep.org has a list of past performances, CBDNA, ABA. I like to just look and see what's there and then find things I don't know, or I'll see a piece or a composer I don't know and think, okay, I should go investigate this. Um, Cause a lot of those groups who are performing are performing sometimes premieres or pieces that were written for that performance. Um, and I keep a running list and I, um, I tell my grad students that they need to be doing this too. I keep a running list of pieces that I hear that spark something in me. Um, and I keep it on a spreadsheet and I write, you know, I read really, really great trumpets to play this piece, or I need 10 percussionists to pull this off little things to keep in mind for when I go to program, but I keep that list going. The place that's usually difficult to find, um, Music is just to go directly to a publisher. That's that's usually a really difficult way to program because you'll always find something, but it's hard to really um, uh, be fully intentional by just going to a publisher. Mm -hmm. And We Were Heard is a really great resource as well. Um, and We Were Heard's mission is taking new music by composers that people may not know very well, or composers who have written pieces that need to be performed by an ensemble and they pair them with an ensemble who will then give a live performance of the piece as opposed to a MIDI of the piece mm. to go on their website so that directors can listen to it. There's a wind ensemble portion. I think there's now a chamber portion and an orchestra, um, an orchestra segment as well. So, and we were heard is a really great one. Nice. 
Um, actually, and we were heard, um, there was just a, uh, I'm scrolling through Facebook and I just saw where a composer, his piece was actually premiered by a high school. And I thought to myself like, oh my gosh, this is very, very amazing, you know, thing for both composers, for us teachers who are trying to find new music. Here's an actual ensemble that is playing it. So you can actually see, okay, well, uh, the percussion is doing this. Okay, I need this, this, and this, and I need that. So it is really good to have that um, that's in our bag. So really good, really good. I will. Um, uh, one thing I've done, like especially for brass, like trumpet and brass, because I was like looking, like I was like two years ago, I was like, how do I find new music that I haven't just been told? Hey, you should look at this. And one thing I went about doing is like I found those composers I really liked or like, oh, I really like how Hindemith does this. Who studied with him? Okay, who did who studied with them? And like try to trace some people's lineage to now who's writing and trace it back like who they studied with to see like maybe some of the compositional styles like trickle down, but they also have a new something because it's a different generation and wave of composers. So mm -hmm. like um, I believe, I hope I'm not wrong, Norman Del uh julio julio mm. joyo del joyo thank you i'm so stupid it's okay um no, i believe not. studied with hindemith at some point um so I, he has a piece for trumpet so i don't have to play the hindemith sonata all the time i can go to uh norman and <laughs> and play his trumpet uh i think it's a sonata and it gives me some of the same stuff but a different take on it and some of his own compositional styles so that was one way I was able to like overcome that. Like, okay, how do I do it without only doing the standards and going from there? Okay, here we go. That was one of the th strategies I used. That's a great idea. Michael, say it with me. Norman Della Joyo. Norman Della Joyo. Yes, we're going to get rid Yay! of the fear. Yeah. I'm like the worst <laughs> about actually pronouncing people's names correctly. Oh. I'm like, y'all, I need like, what is that? What is the thing that a vocalist use? Oh, um, IPA. Oh, IPA. IPA. I need an IPA of just like slathered on my like music. Let office. me just tell you, as a vocalist as well, IPA, first of all, my only B in music education because I just, that, mm -mm, it didn't work for me. <laughs> It didn't work for me. This is why I said, when ensemble, it's mine. It is mine. I just cannot. The IPA, oh. is, I just couldn't. But oh. uh, it has been a pleasure, uh, absolute pleasure having you on today. Um, I have so many notes that now I'm going to go back and start looking at different music and different things. Um, I know the audience is going to enjoy listening to this and really just learning. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been my pleasure. It's been a blast. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we hope you guys enjoyed uh, today's episode. And uh, Dr. Mitchell Spradlin, where can people find you if they want to see the work that you're doing at, at Penn, uh, Penn University? You can find me on the Penn State School of Music social media, Facebook, Instagram, website that will link you to the band's page as well. Um, and then just keep your eyes peeled. I like to just pop up in different places all around. Yeah. I'll be at Midwest. I'm presenting for the high school clinic. So more time working with high school leaders, which I love to do. Um, yeah. Awesome. Love it. Love it. Oh, do you have any concerts coming up? I know we're back in concert season. Do you have any coming up? I do. Uh, December 5th, the Penn State School of Music puts on a mosaic concert. So it's kind of a little sampling of a variety of different studios. So the Wind Ensemble will be performing there. And then a couple of days later, the Wind Ensemble has our final concert of the semester, December 7th. Uh, at 7.30 p.m. And that's available to be streamed from your homes on live stream. Uh, the concert is kind of evolution, looking forward, looking back of the wind band. Uh, so a little bit of the history of the development of the band. A student is writing that narrative. Uh, they're really excited about it. They're doing a really excellent job. So some music that we you would hear at the beginning of the band medium, you know, March pieces that sound like orchestral transcriptions. It mm -hmm. ends with a clarinet concerto, uh, Dana Wilson's Liquid Ebony, Sally Lynn McCune's High Water Rising, oh. investigating a little bit of climate change. So I talked about a concert, a little bit of everything. This will be yeah. a little bit of everything. 
Oh, I, I love, love it. That. Oh, love I'm looking it. forward to hearing that. And that's that's amazing. So guys, make sure you go check that out and check out all the things that Dr. Mitchell Spradlin is doing. Um, and we will see you all next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.